of the moon. So let's get started. I'd like to bring to the stage Ariel Ekblaw. Please give her a warm round of applause. Hello, good morning, Mars. It is delightful to be here with you this morning. I'm Ariel Ekblaw. I'm the director of the MIT Space Exploration Initiative, also CEO of a newly launched startup, Aurelia Institute. And I'm here today to talk to you about the ways in which we are at the cusp of interplanetary civilization. We're at a really remarkable renaissance moment in the space industry right now. Groups like Blue Origin, sending New Shepard up to suborbital space and Virgin Galactic are really help us profoundly democratize access to space. I wanna give a shout out here to Blue Origin and Erica Wagner, if she's in the audience, because Blue Origin was our first pathway within our lab at MIT to get space payloads going. And they are really transitioning and revolutionizing how we get access to translating science in the lab to real life space artifacts. Beyond all of the excitement about these suborbital missions and space tourism, we have an unbelievable moment happening in low Earth orbit within the next few years. For many decades now, whether it was Skylab or Mir or the International Space Station or Tiangong, there have been government-run space stations in orbit. We are about to see within the next few years three commercial space stations doing science, entertainment, industrial manufacturing begin to proliferate and profoundly change how we think about access and participation for everyday citizens in this beautiful near-Earth cocoon that we call low Earth orbit. Beyond low Earth orbit, we're already reaching out further into the near neighborhood of our solar system. Some of you may know the Artemis program at NASA is sending the first human crew back to the surface of the moon in over 50 years this decade. Also particularly meaningful for some of us is that we will send the first woman to the surface of the moon and that the work that we do to establish a sustainable lunar settlement this time, this time as we like to say at MIT, we're going to the moon to stay, will also help us as a gateway to Mars, this moon to Mars program. We're seeing plans already, credible plans, for human Mars missions in the 2030s. And what this reminds us is that this idea of an expansive human presence in space is no longer science fiction, it is at our doorstep. And speaking of science fiction, at my lab at MIT, we are working on building and prototyping and testing and deploying the artifacts of our sci-fi space future, because we are here. So while space entrepreneurs and ESA and NASA work on the rockets to get us there, wherever there may be, Mars, Moon, or beyond, we are working on the human lived experience of space. What are the tools, the products, the experiences, the technologies that you would want to see for a life where you actually envision yourself in a floating microgravity space habitat? We train the space generation, the next generation of explorers, of tourists, of day-to-day -day workers who are gonna be able to actually participate in this future. My lab at MIT supports over 50 50 graduate students, staff, and faculty, and we start everybody on an annual parabolic flight. I wonder if anybody in the audience has done a parabolic flight before or knows what a zero-G flight is. You can raise your hands if you do. They are affectionately known as the Vomit Comet because they fly parabolic arcs in the sky like a roller coaster in the sky and are able to simulate weightlessness. This is how we start our team in the process of not just being a design house or a speculative you know, R&D group, but actually having a launch pipeline for how we get our work tested out in the field in microgravity and in space. So from zero-g flights, so you can see an image of that plane doing that characteristic parabolic maneuver, we move to suborbital platforms like New Shepard with Blue Origin. We've just completed multiple International Space Station missions over the last couple of years and have two more planned in the coming months. And I'd love to announce here today on this stage, we have our sights set on the moon. We have a little bit of a fun uh, inside baseball reference for those of you who are here today and gonna see Justin Cyrus's talk. We at MIT just signed MIT's first ever commercial lunar contract to go to the moon. This means we didn't wait in a grant pipeline for five or 10 years to ask NASA to take us along on a launch. We went to Lunar Outpost, you're gonna hear from Justin Cyrus shortly about the MAP rover and said, we wanna buy payload space. We wanna go now, we wanna go quick. 
And so hopefully, as soon as a few months from now, maybe next year, we'll be flying a swarm robot inspired by Neil Stevenson's Seven Eves and a depth field camera that's gonna take the first ever footage of this really profound area of the lunar south pole and take that depth field imagery, pipe it into VR and AR training for that first human return crew, that Artemis III crew going to the surface of the moon in the future. So we're so excited to be able to actually share this fun fact with all of you, um, especially since you'll be hearing from Justin a little bit later today. This is the team, a representation of the team. As I mentioned before, it's a large undertaking. We have over 40 research projects in our portfolio at any one time, and it takes a team not just of scientists and engineers like myself, but also designers and artists and ethicists, and a really rich envisioning of the future for life in space. We work on everything from zero gravity 3D printing and additive manufacturing, to space fashion, uh, to self-assembly and structures that you'll hear a little bit more about from me later. And part of our goal with this breadth of projects is to represent the beauty of interdisciplinarity, which is something that we are really cherish at the MIT Media Lab, where we do have biologists sitting right next to, in their web lab, wet labs, you know, AI scientists, roboticists, creative architects. And one of the things that we hope to do with the Space Exploration Initiative at MIT in particular is to say, we have this amazing blank slate of space, living life in space, and we have this opportunity to design new cultural artifacts for that environment. As an example, instead of always importing from Earth musical instruments that we've always played here, what would it look like to design a musical instrument that could only be played in microgravity? that has a unique way of experiencing and delighting humans in that environment. So these are the different types of projects that we work on with an amazing team at MIT, and you can see the breadth of some of the research here. I'm now gonna tell you a little bit more about my favorite pet project, my PhD research, which I completed a few years ago. Our goal, beyond just these component technologies and the artifacts that you might experience within a space habitat, is to think even grander. What are the space habitats themselves that are worthy of a life worth lived in space? How can we begin to design robotics technology that is self-assembling? You'll see a video in a few moments of how this technology that I call Tesserae works. The idea is that we can stack tiles flat in a rocket, pentagons and hexagons. They are released into microgravity to elegantly float and self-assemble and form a buckyball. This is just one idea. Once you've been able to make the geometry modular like this, you can imagine many different space structures being able to be built that are much larger than any particular rocket payload fairing. This is what we think will help us scale to becoming a truly space-faring civilization. The inspiration for thinking differently about this space architecture itself as infrastructure was looking at the examples of space architecture that we have thus far, amazing feats of engineering, but pretty limited to aluminum tin cans, to pressure cylinders, to axial geometries. What would it look like to think about a totally different model, a different paradigm for creating large-scale structures in orbit? And I think it needs to be robotic, needs to be autonomous, and instead of being put together like this, as stunning as this image is, it's incredibly risky. It's an astronaut risking their life in a spacesuit, pretending like we're going to build and construct buildings in the vacuum like we build on Earth, where we have a construction crew outside working on a building. There's so much potential to learn and think about different ways that we could actually assemble hardware. One of the sources of inspiration that we draw from is nature. What you're seeing in this image is phyllotaxis, and what we like about this is that it's an example of a grown structure. Can we grow space architecture in the future incrementally, piece by piece, self-assembling? Each unit in this image is a little bit different in size, but predictable in overall geometry, and allows for a certain growth mechanism to really expand and scale, and we're taking some of these biomedic principles into the work of building tesserae. I'm now gonna show you a video and just talk over it lightly as it goes. This is an artist's conception, I will say, as a scientist, a far future conception. We are working on the prototype hardware that you'll see in a minute, of just how tesserae, a self-assembling space structure, might work. So here we see a rocket leaving Earth, rocket payload fairing. As this rocket makes its journey to whatever orbital environment we're headed to, it could be around the moon, in this case it's around Mars, you'll see that the rocket payload fairing begins to open. And what's inside of it is essentially a glorified Pez dispenser. 
It's a way of stacking and releasing these pentagon and hexagon tiles one, at a, one by one, one at a time. Here you can see that idea of the stack. On the edge of each of these tiles, we've designed custom, very powerful electro-permanent magnets. These are magnets that are always attractive, but you can pulse current through them to turn them off. What this means is as the tiles are released to float in a microgravity environment, they want to find each other. They want to dock to their nearest neighbor, and if they dock incorrectly, the sensing and the robotics and the autonomy built into this system can detect that and pulse them off and give them a chance to reassemble. This stochastic-like process is again hearkening back to processes in nature for how things self-assemble. And what you see here is an idea of the module coming together, that buckyball forming, and the hope that in the future, once we build one module, we would actually be able to dock multiple of these different modules together and form a more complicated space station. Now that's the artist's vision. This is the prototype hardware. Uh, we're now actually on version four. These are the three that I can show you. That's the code, the platform, the hardware, the sensors, the electronics that are being matured over the course of multiple different flight missions. So two parabolic flights, a new Shepard uh, Blue Origin flight, and two International Space Station missions. And to bridge from this miniature hardware, which is about the size of a dinner plate or the size of my palm, we also do rigorous physics modeling to simulate at scale human sized tiles and how they would respond in this environment if we were actually trying to assemble this ball in an orbital environment with the Earth's magnetic field and all of these other realistic factors in orbit. Here's a shot of the test array tiles on the historic Axiom 1 mission. We had an amazing opportunity, again an example of how the space industry is changing, on this fully private mission to the International Space Station to test out the test array tiles and did see a stable dome form, which was absolutely fantastic for us in the progression of the research. And our hope with this work is to one day be able to build grand monuments like this. This was meant to be Newton's cenotaph, conceived of in the 1800s, 150 meter span dome, would have been impossible to build because gravity is hard, gravity sucks to build against. But if we could actually begin to think about grand inspiring space cathedrals or microgravity concert halls or expansive space laboratories in orbit, this is the kind of vision that we think we can enable. And this brings us to the anthropocosmos. So with all of these amazing opportunities for the future of life in space and building space architecture, we also have a really significant responsibility as stewards of the space commons. And this is hearkening back to the term Anthropocene, our understanding, our growing understanding of the role that humans have had for better and for worse on our planet. We ought to be really thoughtful early on about the ethics and the ways in which we will act in this near neighborhood of our solar system as we as humanity go out into the cosmos. And in the spirit of this reflection, we released a book with MIT Press last year on the MIT side that is essentially a catalog of those 40 plus projects that I mentioned, but also a statement of our principles and our ethics around how we should be thoughtful, inclusive, and equitable about the future of life in space. What I realized we really needed after this, building beyond the MIT lab ecosystem, is a real life Starfleet Academy. Any of you Star Trek fans out there will know this reference. It is where the space cadets always went to learn to become Captain Jean-Luc Picard, a space captain, a space doctor, a space lawyer. But it was also where the technology of the enterprise was built. And I think we have a real opportunity with a new organization that I've just founded to bring a concept like this to life. So this is a stealth organization. We just went public this spring. The name Aurelia is an old English word for chrysalis, and the meaning behind that logo is to call out the fact that we, humanity, are at the cusp of our next metamorphosis into a spacefaring species. Aurelia will be a profoundly humanist approach to scaling access to space, and we'll work on three different pillars. The first is advanced technology R&D for space habitats. The second is education and outreach in the spirit of Starfleet Academy, doing zero gravity flights for a much broader population beyond MIT, getting ways and courses and educational offerings out to the public. And the third will be a policy think tank so that we are aware of the impact that we might have as participants in the space commons before we get there and are thinking thoughtfully about our impact. We're excited to take the same iterative approach that we've done at MIT 
to structures like this, artificial gravity, self-assembling structures, origami inflatables, and not just do the artist surrender and say this was fun, this was an architectural envisioning project, but actually begin the technical roadmap work so that after this near future that we're already seeing in low Earth orbit, where the Axiom, Orbo Reef, NanoRack stations will be there, maybe technologies like these, grand, inspiring space architecture, really will be ready to be that next generation. We're spinning out of the MIT Space Exploration Initiative with this work, and what we'd like to say is follow along. For those of you who might want to collaborate with us, this is the Aurelia team. And fundamentally, we're seeing so many different propulsion pioneers and space entrepreneurs build us the road to space. It's time to take that road. We think it's time to build space architecture that will make it a life worth living in space. Thank you so much.